When I was asked to do this, I wondered why was I picked? Because there were six project managers for Nimbus. I was the last one. Then I checked out and found out there's only two of us living. And Harry Press is out in yeah. Oregon, yeah, so sure. <laughs> that left me. But uh, what I'm going to do today is cover three areas. One is a little Nimbus background, the history of the start. Second would be some first, but I think Chuck has done a better job of covering first, so I'll, I'll go through that rather quickly. And third will be my observations during the period of time that I was a process manager for, for a Nimbus and Landsat. Well, the Nimbus story begins with the first U.S. meteorology satellite at the uh, Army Signal Corps up at uh, Fort Monmouth. When Bill Stroud proposed an instrument a cloud, a cloud cover measuring instrument for uh, Vanguard. It was one of the five or six instruments that were chosen for Vanguard that would have flown over the, the various missions. It did fly yeah, okay. in yeah. April, uh, February of uh, 59 and operated for 20 days on a, a battery. It was not a solar cell satellite. That was a forerunner of Kairos, <coughs> that program. And that was a part of the the IGY, International Geophysical Year, that started in 57. So it was selected in 57, flew in 59, and then the first Tyros flew, of course, in uh, April of 60. Well, that crew, the Bill Stroud and company, transferred to Goddard. When Goddard was being formed, various groups came together, uh, were brought in as in mass. First one being the, the group in NRL, which was the Vanguard crew. I came in after that. And the next one, the next ones was uh, the group out of Fort Monmouth. There's about 14 or 15 engineers and scientists. And uh, they came to Goddard in April of 59. Well, we'll I hope I don't have to back up. <laughs> I hope you can hear me now. OK, sorry. That team that came down from Monmouth uh, consisted of Stroud, John Lick, Rudy Honnell, uh, Rudy Stomfel, Bill Nordberg, and Bill Bandine. They actually did the design and architecture for Nimbus. So they, they were key in getting this started. And I'm sure there are others, but I got this history from some of Ralph's stuff and some talking to a few individuals. So if I left anybody out, it was no intention to do that. Soon after that, they came, Stroud and Ed Courtright, who was then at headquarters, did a tour of the United States, finding out what the interest was in follow-on satellite, a research satellite. And they then came back and developed the specs and the objectives for it. So that was in later in 59. By 60, Fiscal year 60, which would have been mid-year 59, it was, Nimbus was established as an R&D program to serve the, as a Tyros replacement. There were going to be three satellites, one of them paid for by NASA, and two by what was then ESA, the uh, Environmental Satellite Services Administration. I knew Ralph would get me straight. <laughs> and uh, that got it started. That was a kick. Oh, I'm sorry. I was worried about going backwards. I didn't go forward. OK. All right, well, we, we're with it now. Well, problems developed, as always happens on satellite programs. Uh, none of us have been on one that didn't, certainly in the beginning. And uh, these problems caused ESA to drop out uh, They uh, in 63. So uh, it, Nimbus at that point then became an R&D platform for satellite re Earth uh, remote sensing. It was originally conceived as an in-house project. And some of you were around here in those days. There was a lot of in-house activity going on. Uh, there were, in most times, three or four explorers being worked on and one or two observatories, uh, either parts or are all being worked on. So it wouldn't be unusual to, to bring 
to make Nimbus as an in-house program. Uh, but it was, and of course it was, it was contracted out with General Electric. It was that design that was developed by the Stroud team was really a five-foot diameter ring, which would hold the electronics, and the base then would hold the instruments. And as you've seen in the models around here, the instruments pointed down from there. And it was mentioned earlier also, the sun synchronous orbit was selected to provide observation continuity and, and repeatability about a thousand kilometers circular orbit. Launches were from Vandenberg uh, to, uh, to ensure we would get the, uh, the sun synchronous orbit and the, the uh, midnight, uh, launch at midnight to get to noon equator ascending node orbit. The first four nemesis were on the Thor Gina. The last three, five, six, and seven, were on augmented Thor Delta, or Delta, we call it in those days. As you've heard already, the, each mission was progressively higher resolution, more complex. As Nimbus 1 had three instruments, Nimbus 7 had nine. Nimbus 7 was designated as environmental monitoring satellite. And I remember when I was brought on board, that was something that was pointed out to me. It was a difference from the previous missions. They hadn't used that terminology. But it really was a predecessor to the Earth observation satellites and the ISAT that's ongoing today. As you've already heard, there's been, over the 30-year period, 33 instruments uh, have been on board the Nimbus, seven Nimbus satellites. The operating lifetimes are kind of interesting. The first mission, and I find this surprising, but that's what Ralph's history tells me, <laughs> had a six-month lifetime. It did not meet it, of course. It had the problem with the uh, solar array drive uh, locked up. But uh, uh, four, five, six, and seven uh, had five-year lifetimes, and they all went beyond that all the way out as far as the number seven, 15 years. So uh, a lot of good data was gathered out of those seven missions over that 30 year period, which would have only provided you if it just met the mission lifetime, far less uh, good usefulness. The numbers first, and Chuck has touched on some of these, the, the numbers four was the first one with an onboard computer using uh, TI uh, integrated circuits. And it was the first civilian satellite with uh, three axis stabilization to one degree accuracy. There probably were satellites that uh, they don't talk about in open forum that had a, a greater uh, pointing capacity, but uh, this was the first in a civil satellite. And the first RTG uh, that uh, was on Nimbus 2, and then of course. Uh, was lost and then recovered, as was mentioned earlier. Thank you. Okay. Continuous operations, and the continuous means ongoing, began with, at least on these three instruments, the, uh, the IRIS, the BUV, and the TOMS. The IRIS started in April of 1969, uh, the uh, BUV on April of 70, and in October of 78, the first TOMS, the ozone mapping instrument. The twirly rams, which you'll hear more about later on, uh, was first uh, to do the, for the forerunner of international search and rescue. They never called it that, but actually the Nimbus basic spacecraft was what I would call the first multi-purpose spacecraft. There were 10 of them. 
three of them for uh, Landsats and seven for Nimbus. And in those days, I don't know of any other program that had that length of, of missions using the same spacecraft, same basic spacecraft design. The Nimbus 7 measured sea surface temperatures. I'm not sure where Chuck mentioned that one. I'm sure it's on his chart. And one I'll talk to a little bit later is that we did the first field disassembly on Nimbus uh, G or Nimbus 7 later. Now with some of my observations as project manager. It was obvious when I was asked to join the project and I had never worked on an earth pointing mission. I had been involved with missions that were science missions looking at, at either astronomy, high energy astrophysics or fields and particles in situ measurements. The team I determined very quickly was a very competent, very good team. And I learned something from a fellow named Edwards Deming, who uh, was an expert in, uh, efficiency expert. He's the guy that went to Japan and straightened out their auto industry right after World War II. He said, the willing worker will always do the right thing if management doesn't screw them up. And I was determined not to screw them up. And this gang of folks, some of them of which are here, w were outstanding. They, it, it was no problem they couldn't tackle. And they had worked it from the, from the basic design to, to getting data products out in a timely manner. Something else I found out joining that project is you had, at that, at that point, four satellites on orbit plus Two, that would be three Nimbuses, one Landsat, and one Landsat and one Nimbus in the assembly stage uh, in preparation for launch. So it was a, like a whole new ball game. Not only did you have to be concerned with getting the ones on, up at Valley Forge built and launched, but you had to worry, is Ralph going to call me in the middle of the night and say that the tape recorder stopped or something? But he knew it wouldn't do any good to do that, so he, uh, he didn't do it. Another thing we found that this mission, number seven, didn't have principal investigators like earlier missions had, and certainly like, not like the science missions I'd been used to. Instead, they were the experiment teams, and they, they define the instrument requirements, they define how it should be built and tested, and they also de define the algorithms for taking the radiances and conver converting it into useful information. So they went cradle to grave, and those were very, very good, competent teams, anywhere from three to seven people per team. Also found that you can never please all the scientists, certainly with giving them enough calibration. I had an occasion on Nimbus 7 when it's going into thermal vacuum, final thermal vacuum test as an integrated observatory. Got a call from our guys who are up there working it. They say, we cannot satisfy one scientist. He will not say we're ready to start thermal vacuum because he has not had enough calibration. So I grabbed a car and a bottle of scotch and I went up there to talk to him. <laughs> it was an interesting conversation. And I thought I was going to have rebellion. But after about half the scotch was gone, uh, they, they were convinced that we'll make it work because I said, we will go into thermal vacuum. And we'll tell the scientists that's just the way it is. You'll fly, you don't fly. And I said, by the way, if he really gives you a rough time, you could put him in a chamber with it, but it's probably not a good idea. Well, it turns out that instrument operated for 15 years. So I guess he had enough calibration because he put out a lot of good information. Another interesting one that I oh, guess it better. Yeah, here we go. I got a call one day from the center director, Bob Cooper. We were already had shipped Nimbus G out to the Western Test Range and preparing it for mating to the Delta. And he said, solder balls have been found in a tape recorder in RC, at RCA, and those tape recorders are just like the ones on board your spacecraft. So disassemble them, take them out, and have them inspected. 
So I go to GE and say, uh, I've been directed that we need to take out those three tape recorders and inspect them. And their reaction was, you got to be kidding. We don't do field disassembly. We never have done field disassembly. And therefore, it will have to be taken back to Valley Forge and disassembled up there and then subjected to a new, whole new series of tests. And oh, by the way, that's big bucks and whole lots of time. I said, nope, that won't work. Develop me some, some procedures for taking it apart in the field. We'll review those procedures. Our team will review them with you. If we're satisfied, we will proceed to do it that way. Well, we did. Took them out, all three tape recorders. No solder balls were found. Put it back together and just did functional testing, no environmental testing. And we flew. And we had operated for 15 years, so I guess that was all right. Another interesting phone call was one morning, phone rang, and this gentleman says, I'm calling from Bar Harbor, Maine. My name is Max Anderson. And I'm getting ready to fly a balloon across the Atlantic. And I hear you guys got something that might be of use to me if I have problems. And I knew the right guy to call, Chuck Cody. And I called Chuck, and he'll tell you the rest of the story later. This is one that probably most people don't believe, but we actually did come in under budget on number seven. I don't know that any other mission can say that, and it wasn't massive amounts of money, but it was something around a million dollars, which uh, in those days was still a decent amount of money. I don't know about today, though. One last thing I'll close with. After I took over at Tedris, I went down to Johnson Space Center and was talking to the deputy director. And he was asking me, what had I done before I came on Tedris? And I said, well, the most recent experiences with Landsat and Nimbus launched them last year. He said, oh, that's nice, but that's not really NASA. You know, I think the scientific discoveries and the technological advancements that we've seen from Nimbus and still seeing today with programs here at Goddard, that's real NASA. Thank you. <laughs>